All right, good to be back in Ohio. Uh, I was here earlier this year. Me and Bill were talking about that. I was trying to remember exactly when. Uh, the last few months have been a blur for me. Uh, I've Actually, Dave, I've moved to California, so we haven't talked about that yet. So I moved out there uh, this month, actually, just about a week and a half ago, and um, came here to Ohio to do some new shows, some new YouTubes, uh, sermon for the Philippines and uh, the sermon today. So I've been busy the last uh, few weeks, a little too busy at times, uh, but it's good to be back with you guys. I feel at home here, so um, good to be in Ohio and delivering the sermon for you today. So what I'm going to discuss today is Mary and the Saints. Now, for those of you that maybe have a Roman Catholic or a Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox background, you probably have ideas in your mind immediately when I say Mary and the saints. Because in the Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, the veneration, the platitudes, the way that people feel about Mary and the saints, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today, is almost to the level of how we feel about Jesus Christ and God the Father. At least, that's what I experienced when I was in the Greek Orthodox Church growing up. And, and to, I want to tell you a little story to kind of bring you into this subject. I was about 12, 13, 14 years old, and uh, my grandfather on my mother's side of the family uh, moved in with us because my grandmother had died and uh, my mom, you know, was going to take care of her dad. So uh, he moved in with us for the last 10 years or, of his life or so. So he used to tell me story after story of life in the old country, in Greece. So he immigrated from Greece in the early 1900s, and this one story always stuck with me that he was in the church uh, in his hometown, and uh, they had this tradition there that you would affix a coin to an icon of the Virgin Mary, and you'd pray for something. And if the coin stayed on the icon long enough, then you would get your wish or your prayer answered. And he told me about a friend of his who also put a coin on the Virgin Mary. They both wanted to make it to the United States. And the, uh, the, the moral of the story from him was that he made it, but his friend did not. And he believed that Mary answered his prayer and got him to the United States. That was his mindset because of the traditions within the Greek Orthodox Church, especially in Greece, and what he had learned growing up. Now, he wasn't a very educated man, and uh, you know I listened to the story, and I knew it well because he told it to me probably a dozen times over the years. And then one day, years later, when I was doing research, trying to figure out, do I want to stay in the Greek Orthodox Church? Because I was learning things in the Bible that the church was not teaching. Some of the things the church was teaching were opposite of what was in the Bible. I came across this book, it was called uh, Survivals of Greek Religion or something like that. And in the book, the author starts to tell you about ancient Greek and Roman religion. And he said in this one section of the book that the ancient Greeks and Romans used to affix coins to the statues of gods and goddesses or the pictures of gods and goddesses as a form of divination, that you would pray to the god or goddess and affix this coin with some wax on it, and if the coin stayed on the statue or the picture, then your prayer would be answered. And I went, oh my goodness, that, how, how did my grandfather, how did that tradition start on this Greek island? It didn't start from the Bible, folks. The direct result of this pagan syncretism, this combination of religion, I believe, and many scholars say the same thing, came from these ancient pagan traditions within Europe, and they passed into the church. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Now, I tell you that story as I begin to tell you more facts and information about Mary and the saints, how they are venerated within these churches, and why we should not pray to Mary and the saints. Why we should not venerate Mary and the saints 
in the way that the Catholics and the Orthodox do. Now, I've written a booklet on this subject. It's been running in the international news. We finally got to the last installment of it. So this booklet will be on the website very soon. So a lot of the details I'm providing you today, there's more that you can read within this booklet that I've written and maybe evangelize your Catholic and Orthodox friends. But, but why do the Catholics and the Orthodox believe that they can get away with these traditions that I believe are coming from paganism? Well, they believe it for this reason, and this is important to understand. They believe that the Bible isn't all there is to truth. They believe that holy tradition, what the church fathers have said over the last 2,000 years, is equal to this book. Now, that's their opinion. They can have whatever opinion they like, but here's the problem with that opinion. What their tradition is saying goes against the Bible. So now you got a problem here, folks. You've got tradition saying one thing, and the opposite is said in the Bible. Now for me, that caused some dissonance, okay? I said, wait a minute, I can't deal with this. i got to get out of here, okay? So I left the Orthodox Church, and here I am. But for many, they don't even know the information I'm going to reveal to you today. Many have not looked into it. Many have not studied it. But for the intellectuals within the church, they equate their tradition with the Bible, but then the question you have to ask them is, wait a minute, wait a minute, some of this tradition is diametrically opposed to what the Bible says. <laughs> and, and there's a problem there, folks, no matter who you are. So that is something to bring to the, uh, the, the debate if you get in to that debate with these folks. Now, what, what proof do I have of this? Again, my proof is going to be from the Bible, and uh, I want to talk to begin with a little bit about Mary in Scripture. Because I'll, I'll tell you, in the church I grew up in, in the dome of that church, which is in the center of the church, you can look up and you see this huge picture of Mary. Gigantic, looking down on you, and in her arms is the baby Jesus. Do you get the picture I'm painting for you? Mary is huge in the picture, and the baby Jesus is down here in a secondary position. Okay, again, it's just a picture, I get that, but the domination of Mary in some churches, the cults within the Roman Catholic Church, if you go to Europe and look at some of these places where there were apparitions of Mary, and you see the adulation and how involved people are in Mary, in Mary, in Mary and not Jesus Christ. Now, the priests and the bishops will tell you, well, we pray to Mary and we pray to the saints, but they petition Jesus. God answers the prayer. But do the lay people actually believe that? In the experience I had with my grandfather and others that I grew up with, no, they're, they're into Mary and the saints. Yeah, they, they love God too, I wouldn't be here without my grandfather yelling at me to get out of bed. The devil's keeping you in bed. you got to go to church and this and that. So I love my grandfather for pushing me to read the Bible, which he did. But then that led me to reject his church. And that's another story. I'm not going to get into that right now. But, but when we look at the, inf the information, I believe that we have to make the choice of discarding these traditions that are not biblical. Let me lay it out for you a little bit. When you see how much veneration there is for Mary, the icons, the statues, the prayers, you look in your Bible and you say, I just don't see that there. There isn't the level of information about Mary for the emphasis that is put on her within the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches of the world. Let me give you just one scripture as an example. Again, knowing how much they put into Mary, you know, the, the prayer, the Hail Mary, full of grace, etc., etc., uh, the, the, the pictures, 
uh, the, the, the different cults, the different things that are going on in the church, the feast days for Mary, the feast days for the saints. Yet you don't see that type of data about Mary in the Bible. And one interesting scripture to note here is over in Matthew 12. Now again, this is Jesus speaking, so this is significant. In Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading in verse 48 of Matthew 12. And here's what we read there. Matthew 12, verse 48. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. So, so here's why I point out this scripture. If Mary has such great emphasis, why isn't Christ making a note of that in scripture? Why isn't Christ emphasizing that in scripture? Here he's got a perfect opportunity to do it, but he's downplaying Mary here. He's downplaying his brothers and his sisters here, rather than raising them up to the level that the Catholic and Orthodox Church have raised Mary to. But here's probably the biggest point about praying to Mary and the saints. Folks, Mary and the saints cannot hear anything. Mary and the saints cannot speak. Mary and the saints are not in heaven according to your Bible. And that's a problem when you've got tradition that says, oh yeah, they are. Not according to your Bible. You guys know all the scriptures. I'll just give you a couple. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Let's take a look at it. We could go to Ecclesiastes 3. We could go to the Psalms. We could go all over the Bible and see that so-and-so slept with his fathers and -and so-and-so slept with his fathers. There's a reason the Bible uses those words. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, let me just read it to someone on the tape program who will hear this and not maybe know this. For the living know they shall die, But the dead, Mary has died, the saints have died, the dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun." Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Folks, that's read to all of us except Jesus Christ, okay? He's the only one that's different, okay? He's the only one that's overcome this. Everybody else is human being, flesh and blood, started out here on planet Earth. Mary, St. Paul, St. Stephen, you name it. It doesn't matter the saint. It doesn't matter if it's Mary. They all started out like you and me, planet Earth, and they are all dead when they die. They cannot hear, they cannot see, they cannot do anything until a future resurrection. You guys know the drill. You know that. And I hope someone hearing this tape someday begins to see that who's a Roman Catholic or an Orthodox Christian out there. Because I know that you believe in Jesus Christ, but you've got to understand the truth of your Bible. I could go to many scriptures in the Psalms that say the same things, but for time constraints, I will just go to one. It's over in Psalm 6 and verse 5. So let me go ahead and read that to you. Psalm 6 and verse 5 says the following. 
for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, who shall give thee thanks? It's a rhetorical question. The answer's already been given. Nobody's given you thanks in the grave. There's no remembrance. There's nothing you can do in the grave. You're dead. You're out of it until that resurrection day, one when Christ returns, one at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, having set this all up, I want to address some of the dogmatic positions that the Catholic and Orthodox Church take on Mary, and I want to show you from Scripture that these positions are deficient, that there is a major problem with them. I'm going to begin with the Immaculate Conception. Now, being from Pittsburgh, I didn't say the Immaculate Reception, okay? That's a joke for you Clevelanders here. I'm, I'm sorry out there, okay. But anyway, I'm talking about the Immaculate Conception. What is the Immaculate Conception? That Mary was born without original sin. Now, you don't find that in the Bible. You don't find a definition of original sin in the Bible either. That, that's another story. But original sin stems from, according to the Catholics, stems from the disobedience of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Since that first sin in the Garden, all of humanity is burn, born with this predilection to sin due to our original parents, Adam and Eve. Now, we believe that we're all sinners, but we don't believe a little baby is, is sinful, okay? That that baby coming out of the womb, that baby's sinful right there. The Catholics teach that that baby is sinful, that he was born with original sin. Now, we all have that sin nature, and it develops in our, in our life. Okay, that's how we see this differently from the Catholics. But this idea that you're born with original sin, and there were some other ideas they brought to the fore at this time. Let me make you aware of them. There was an early Christian bias. I'm talking in the 100s, 200s A.D. There was an early Christian bias against sexuality. That sexuality was quote-unquote dirty. That to be an ascetic, to be uh, not involved in sex, you were closer to God if you were in that way. Okay, These were ideas that developed among some of the church fathers, some of the leaders within the early Christian church. Augustine taught that original sin was transmitted by procreation. Again, where's this coming from? Well, if you study up on Augustine a little bit, there were some issues there around sexuality. Okay, You can read about that yourselves. But these ideas were from the leaders of the Christian church at that time. And that became influential in how people looked at sex, how they looked at someone who would go off into the desert and live by themselves versus somebody who got married to somebody. The guy out in the desert living by himself was thought of, of as holier. Well, I'll tell you what, I think life's a lot easier by yourself than with your wife or husband, you know? I think, I think God put us together to help us learn love better. It's a lot easier to go by yourself and you know, not worry about anything. Believe me. Okay, uh, enough said about that. Uh, let me get back off that tangent there. Um, so getting back to this... Uh, idea that the early church fathers had of a, of a negative connotation to sex, when they started thinking about the Virgin Mary and placing her up on this pedestal, these ideas began to develop that if God was born from Mary, then Mary probably had no involvement in sex at all. That, that's, that's how this happened. That's how this developed. And so what happens is you get this idea that Mary was always a virgin. That's why they call her the Virgin Mary. Now I'm going to get to some scriptures in a moment, but this is how this idea of her perpetual virginity developed because the early church fathers had these ideas, these wrong ideas, about human sexuality. God says it's okay in marriage, okay? Nothing wrong with it, okay? But they had some issues... And those issues became dominant in the early years of Christianity and began to influence the church. But what does the Bible say about Mary's sexuality? Okay, Because not only did they believe Mary stayed virgin her entire life, they believed Mary's parents 
did not come together to conceive Mary. They believed Mary was an immaculate conception. Like, like who, folks? Like Jesus Christ. But folks, this is not in your Bible. There's nothing said that's even close to that in your Bible. Yet that is what they teach. Now, what does the Bible say about Mary's perpetual virginity? Matthew 13, Matthew 13, verses 54 and 55. Matthew 13, verses 54 and 55. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Now, did you see what that said? It says Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now, you might say, well, Mike, how does the Catholic and Orthodox Church get around this? Well, hey, folks can get around anything, folks, okay? So here's what they say. Well, maybe Joseph had children from a previous marriage because he was an older man, okay? But where does that idea come from? It comes from apocryphal writings during the centuries of Christianity. So again, that's why apocryphal books are not in the Bible, folks, because they're not true. They're not true. They have some history. They have some truth. But they also have false heretical ideas that have led people away from the trunk of truth, which is your Bible. Now, let's think about this. May Maybe Mary had some children here. Others argue about the wording there. Brothers can mean cousins. Well, there's, there's a Greek word for cousins, and there's one for brothers and, and sisters. It's true that that word can sometimes mean cousins, but there's another word you would use if they were cousins, okay? But let's look at another scripture in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 25. Was Mary perpetually a virgin her entire life? Matthew 1 and verse 25. Okay, so we're talking here about the birth of Jesus. Let me begin in verse 24. Um, let me begin in verse uh, 23, actually, because that gives us a greater contextual understanding here. Matthew 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Now get this, verse 25. And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now I began in verse 23, because what does the prophecy say in Isaiah? about the, the virgin. Now again, we're not going to get into the uh, Hebrew words there. People argue, well, did that really mean virgin or young lady? Or We're not going to get into that. Here's the point I want to make. Here in the Greek, it does mean virgin. Okay? That this would be a virginal birth, an immaculate conception. Okay? And notice in verse 25, he knew her not till... Virgin, verse 23, knew her not till verse 25. What's the context, folks? They're trying to tell you up until Jesus was born, Mary was a virgin. This was an immaculate conception. This was a miracle from God. They're trying to make that point. And then what do they do in 25? Hey, just like normal people when they get married, she had sexual relations after that point. But up until that point, the emphasis is there. She was a virgin. This was a miracle. This is a special birth. Mary was not a special birth. Jesus Christ was. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Mary can't do anything. She's a great woman. She's a great woman. Okay? But do you think Mary was the only woman on earth 
that Jesus could have picked. Do you think Moses was the only man on earth that Jesus could, could have picked? What does God say? I'll raise up stones to do my work if I want to. But he used certain individuals, but let's not make them into demigods. That is what Satan wants. That is what Satan wants. That's his manipulation. Because he wanted to be like the Most High. And what has he done to these great people in history like Mary and the saints? He's created demigods within Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Now I know my friends in Catholic churches and Orthodox friends are going to say, that's not a demigod to me. I, I get that. I understand that. But I also grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. I saw people bowing down and putting a candle next to the Virgin Mary's icon or a saint's icon. I heard my grandfather go on and on and on about what this saint did and what that saint did and what Mary did. Folks, we can't take the emphasis off of the main character. That's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants you to get your eye off the ball, get into this world, lose the focus of the kingdom. And he does it in so many ways. He's not only doing it with the atheists and agnostics out there, he's doing it with people who are sincere and deeply have faith in Jesus Christ and God. And he's got them practically worshiping. Men and women also. And that is a danger. That is not truth. That is not truth. And we need to call it out. We need to call it out. There was a book that was written from 140 to 170 A.D. called the Proto-Evangelium of James. Why use the name of James? He was the brother of Jesus. It might get some play with people in the Christian world. I'm going to call this the, the evangelism of James here. Because maybe people are going to read it and believe it. And they did. They did believe it because it talked about the immac Immaculate Conception and perpetual virginity of Mary. A hundred years after the New Testament was complete. And it had an anti-sexual slant and it gained prominence in the Christian church. Ladies and gentlemen, was Mary sinless? That goes with her perpetual virginity. That goes with why she was assumed to heaven. She was sinless. She lived a sinless life. But what, what the Scriptures say? Are we going to believe our Bibles or church tradition? Church fathers? Popes? Who are we going to believe? My Catholic and Orthodox friends, who are we going to believe? Romans 3, 23. Read your Bibles. For all have sinned. Let me say it again. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Except who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has not sinned. That's why we have the chance for eternal life. But Mary sinned, folks. St. Paul sinned. Moses sinned. They all were human like you and me. And they sinned according to the truth of God. But some of our religious leaders are not aware of this fact. At least that seems to be the case. Now, what about the assumption of Mary to heaven? This is another doctrine within the Catholic Church. It is not a dogma within orthodoxy. They don't have to believe that Mary was assumed bodily to heaven, but many of them do, okay? Uh, but the Catholics have made it a doctrine within their church. Pope Pius XII in 1950s mentioned this when he created this dogma, this doctrine in the church that Mary was bodily assumed to heaven. Again, look at the year this was uh, conducted. 1950. 1950, somebody says, Mary went to heaven. Somebody in 1950 decides Mary went bodily to heaven. 1950. When did Mary die? You, you get my point here. You get my point. Now, Here's, here was some of the reasoning Pope Pius gave, and this is important. I want, you, I want you to get this point. Pope Pius gave some reasoning why 
they believe Mary was bodily assumed to heaven. And he mentioned certain church fathers' names. He said, so-and-so thought it, and -and so-and-so here thought it, and this guy thought it. Within our Catholic tradition, these church fathers believed Mary was assumed bodily to heaven. Now, that's true. These individuals did think that. But if you go to the writings of those individuals, the reason those individuals thought Mary was bodily assumed to heaven was because of apocryphal works that had been created long after Mary died that said she went bodily to heaven. You get get my drift here. But the Pope didn't mention that they were using these apocryphal works in their writings to say why they assumed Mary went to heaven. But here's the, here's the kicker. Get this now. Previous popes in 494 to 496, Pope Galatius said that some of these writings were not canonical, that they shouldn't be in the Bible. We shouldn't use that for doctrine. And again, in 520 AD, Pope Hermesdus agreed with Pope Galatius that these apocryphal works should not be used for doctrine. Do you get what I'm saying here? Earlier popes had said, we shouldn't use these books for doctrine. And in 1950, another pope says, well, so-and-so said that he believed Mary went to heaven, and -and so-and-so said it, but so-and-so were using books that other popes had said should not be used for doctrine. (laughs) Do you see the hypocrisy, or am I just seeing it? Is there not a problem with that? Is there not a problem with that? When you begin to learn this history, it blows your mind. It blows your mind. It's real simple, folks. Let's keep it real simple. This is the truth. Let's not worry what this guy said and that guy said and what this guy wrote and that guy wrote. Let's worry about what God inspired to be written in the pages of your Bible. And just for one final point, John 3.13. Again, I don't need to read it to you. No one has ascended up into heaven but he that has come down from heaven, speaking of the Son of Man, speaking of Jesus Christ. That was written years after Jesus died. Folks, it's real simple. It's real simple. Mary did not go to heaven. But you know what? Pagans believed that mother goddesses did go to heaven. Now I'm going to get to that in a moment. But let me talk a little bit about apparitions before I get to that. Now, you've probably heard about Virgin Mary apparitions throughout history. It's a big thing within the Catholic Church. It was a big thing within the Orthodox Church. You've heard of Lourdes and Bernadette. You've heard of Fatima in Portugal. You've heard of Metagorgi in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And I'm going to focus in on Metagorgi since that's the most modern one. That began prior to the Bosnian Wars of the 1990s. This began in the 1980s, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but the booklet gets into detail. You need to read that detail. Most of the people who've had apparitions of the Virgin are children between the ages of 7 and 18. Now, there have been adults who've had apparitions also. There have been hoaxes that have been confirmed hoaxes. But age 7 to 18, with the average age being 9, did you know that fact? That most of the apparitions have been reported by children between those ages, with the average age being only 9. Folks, when I was nine, I thought Godzilla was real. Okay, you get what I'm saying here? Do you get what I'm saying here? There's a problem. There's a problem with these apparitions. Now, I'm going to focus in on Metagorgy because it's been the one that's been most scientifically studied. I mean, people have like uh, gotten with these young people, these, these, or they're older people now, They've tested them, brain waves, uh, psychological questioning. Uh, they've been through the ringer, okay? And, and I get into that in the, in the booklet. But during these scientific tests, some of the scientists have said that something's going on, <laughs> something's going on 
when these kids get into their trance-like vision state. Okay, what, something different is happening to them. Okay, they've admitted that uh, they're, they're noticing something different in the brain waves, and, and something is happening when these children were in this state of seeing a vision. But, but here's another problem, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to give all the details, but read the booklet. Here's another problem with these visions and these visionaries. The, their stories of what the Virgin is telling them. Okay, and I'm going to tell you what some of the stories were with Metagorgy. So these children, again, they're Catholic children, little children, growing up in a Catholic, very Catholic country, okay? And uh, they said that Mary had taken them on a trip to see heaven, to see hell, and to see purgatory. Now again, where do we find that? Not in your Bible, not the way they described it, okay? Yeah, hell was going to be a burning of the wicked at the end, and that's the end of them, okay? But that's not what these kids were describing. They were describing the hell that is the false conception of hell that many Christians have. That people were turning black and burning and yelling and screaming. And that's what these children saw when Mary showed them hell. They, she showed them heaven, and one of the children whose mother had recently died was able to talk to her mother in heaven, communicate with her mother. Doesn't say that in the Bible, folks. And also, they went to purgatory. Folks, purgatory, that's a, that's a Catholic conception, okay? That comes actually from Platonic thinking, too. Plato had a place where people went that was in between. That's not biblical. But these kids were seeing what? They were seeing what was in their mind from what they had been taught by their elders. But who, here's the, here's the bigger question. If they were seeing this, who was showing it to them, folks? <laughs> who was showing it to them? Do you believe the devil's real? Do you believe he's real? Like, I mean real, like I see Bill right there. Bill is real, okay? <laughs> Now, I'm sorry to use, use an example now, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to relate it to the devil. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. But, but, like, do you get the realness of Satan the devil? That he's out there, and he's doing things. He is making things happen. Look at this world. I mean, look at the world, folks. I don't need to say much more than that. You've been around long enough. Satan is out there and he's working it, folks. He's working it like nobody else. So, if these visionaries are seeing things that are not the truth of the Bible, what are they seeing? And who is showing it to them? Revelation 12, verse 9, for those who may not know the Scriptures like this audience, I just want to make them aware of some Scriptures. Revelation 12, and verse 9, says the following, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. He deceives the whole world. You know, he's got the whole world in his hand, too. From the opposite side of things. He doesn't care if you're a child. He doesn't care if you're a priest. He doesn't care who you are. He wants to rip you apart. He wants to take you away from God. And what about the innocence of children? Oh, children are innocent. Who's going to dissuade a child or, or say that child is seeing something they shouldn't be seeing? Isn't that the perfect foil? Isn't that the perfect foil for these types of stories? Well, children are innocent. They're not going to see something of Satan. Oh, I'll get to a Catholic priest and what he quoted here in a minute. Other scriptures, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. What does that one say? 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. Folks, he has the power to blind the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the Bible, folks, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 
Now this is hard-hitting stuff. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Folks, read that for what it says. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Read that for what it says, and that scared me. That scared me coming up in the Orthodox Church when I started to read these scriptures. And I started to say to myself, there's some cognitive dissonance here. The Bible is saying one thing. My priest is telling me, it's okay, we can, we can make pagan things Christian. We, we can do that. I had, a, I had a monk from Greece who was there when I was asking the priest the question, and then he started talking in Greek to the priest. I couldn't hear it. My dad overheard him saying, what's this kid talking about? Put him in his place. <laughs> My dad told me. I'm glad he told me. Okay, because it told me something. It told me something that the priest folks, the monks folks, the nuns folks, they're just humans like you and me. They're just humans like you and me. And I don't have to go into the Catholic story of the pedophilia and all that, because you guys know that already. They're human like you and me. And some of them are warped. And some of them have major problems. But because they've got a collar, and because they're in a position, these traditions within orthodoxy and Catholicism have gotten the people within those churches to think of them as something more than they are. Father, Father, bow and kiss the hand. Come up and get your bread at the end of service. Bow and kiss the hand. Kissing somebody's hand, what, what's that all about? Now, I know there were Christian kisses thousands of years ago, but, but I feel weird about that, <laughs> okay? Somebody kissing my hand all day. I'd feel weird about that. I don't know how that got started, but, but that's what we did. That's what we did. Folks, there's a war, a spiritual war going on out there, and you got to fight like crazy to get into God's kingdom. Matthew 7.15. Matthew 7.15, another scripture to think about in this subject matter. Matthew 7. And verse 15, notice what it says. Matthew 7 and 15 says the following. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now let me just say this. I met many good priests in the church. Many people who really believed in Jesus Christ and God. Don't get me wrong about this. I want to say that side of things also. Okay, and not just give you the bad side of things. In fact, the majority are probably good people. Okay, but just like anywhere else, folks, there are problems. We know that in this church too. Okay, let's be honest. Let's be transparent here. Second Thessalonians two nine. One more scripture here, just for good measure. These are important scriptures. You need to mark these ones in your Bible. Second Thessalonians two, and verse nine says the following, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. The truth. The truth is what it's about. They received not the love of the truth. I've shown you so far today that they have these doctrines and beliefs which are not the truth. They are actually opposite of the truth. And what's it say here? That this is talking about the, the uh, beast at the end. And what's it saying in verse 9? Whose coming is after the working of Satan 
with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Power, signs, and lying wonders. What's a lying wonder? Could it be an apparition of the Virgin Mary? Folks, we know Mary's not in heaven. We know Mary can't talk. So who's talking? Who's talking? It's not God. It's not of God. God would be going against His Word. What's the logical conclusion? What is the logical conclusion? Do I need to spell it out for you? Read the booklet. (laughs) But let me give you a quote, not from me, not from an agnostic, not from an atheist. I'm going to quote a Catholic priest. I'm going to quote a Catholic priest on what happened in Metagorgy. Let, let me read to you what Father Philip Pavlich said, Pavich said, and he's quoted in the book The Miracle Detective. Uh, a writer wrote a book about Marian apparitions focusing on Metagorgy. And you, if you haven't read it, it's an eye-opening expose about apparitions and history and metagorgy. Here's Father Philip Pavich, a Roman Catholic priest, quoted in that book, and he's asked about what he thinks is going on in metagorgy. Catholic priest now, okay? Listen to what he says. Well, I exclude hallucination and human invention, absolutely. After eight years here, I feel certain that the visionaries are in touch with a spirit entity. But is it the mother of God? There is some testimony I find difficult to deny. Rita Klaus, she's a remarkable miracle story. Wonderfully healed and a very powerful presence. So there have been some healings that people have said have come from them going to Metagorgy. But then, on the other hand, there's the story of Agnes Heppel who also received a miraculous healing and is turned into the leader of a cult. With the fruits, it's sort of a pick-and-choose situation. A lot of people hold that it was Mary in the beginning, but somewhere she checked out, and the visionaries have carried on without her. There's also the theory that visionaries are only human and make mistakes, and you'll read about that in the book. And then the other possibility is that it's a dark spirit disguising itself as the mother of God. This is a Catholic priest admitting that this this could be. A dark spirit disguised as the mother of God, which is not uncommon. He's aware, folks. He reads his Bible, and he knows about Catholic history. And read my booklet. There are some interesting stories in there. It has happened frequently in the past. And I tell you one interesting story in the booklet. In his second letter to the Corinthians, we just read it, Paul writes that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The Vasula, this lady named Vasula Ryden, thing sort of points this way. So Vasula Ryden is some type of a seer who says she's getting all these visions from God, and again, she's going to hell, she's going to heaven, she's going to purgatory, she's seeing all kinds of stuff, okay? He's got an issue with this. Now get this, here's his final comment. I know I haven't spoken clearly about what I believe it is. It's almost like I'm afraid to say it out loud. To say I believe that this entity is not the mother of God, but an evil spirit, one that comes as though benign, but leaves a bloody mess on the ground. That's what a Catholic priest is saying who lived there for eight years and experienced the carnival atmosphere that was taking place there. People would come on mission journeys to Metagorgy and go see the sites where Mary was seen. And money was made. Buku bucks were made by people selling Mary statues and selling prayer books, etc., etc., etc. Oh yeah, he's out there, man. He's doing his thing. Now, in the remaining moments I have, I just want to spend a little time on the saints. What's a problem with saint veneration? Well, first of all, you're telling us 
that these individuals are in a higher plane than us regular Christians, okay? You pray to the saints so they have a more direct line to God than you do. That's basically what the Catholics and Orthodox say, okay? They don't say that the saints answer your prayers. They're very careful about that, okay, because of Scripture, all right? But they say that they've got, a, they've got a direct line to God, okay? It's a little better than your line, Bill, okay, and my line, okay? They, they're, they're right there in heaven, Bill. And, and they were great people on earth, and the church has decided that we should call them a saint, so now they got a, a better line to Jesus than you do. They're closer to the boss than, than you and I are, okay? That's, that's what they teach if you really get down to it. Okay, again, that's my opinion. They aren't going to say that. But that's my opinion, folks. I grew up in that church. Now, what about this idea, and how did it develop in Christendom? Well, let's go back to what I was saying about Greek and, and, and uh, Roman religion, early Greek and Roman religion. You guys all know that there were hundreds and thousands of Greek gods and goddesses and Roman gods and goddesses. There was a day for every god and goddess in the Roman world and the Greek world. You know what, what I, my mother and grandfather used to put on our wall in our kitchen? They put the church calendar up there, and on each day of the church calendar, it was Saint so-and-so for this day and Saint so-and-so for that day. Folks, some days have more than one saint on them, okay? And every day was a veneration of that saint on that particular day. Again, why are we making this more complicated? Why are we bringing all these figures into it when we only got to go to God? We're only dealing with God according to the Bible. Well, here's why. Because when you go back into early Roman religion, early Greek religion, there was a pantheon of gods and goddesses. And what happened over time is what you prayed for to that god or goddess. Sailors prayed to Poseidon to get across the oceans. Well, you know what? You pray to St. Nicholas now. He's the patron saint of sailors. He will get you across the ocean. Hera was the queen, guardian of women and marriage functions. Do you know in the church today, you pray to St. Catherine for marriage functions. How, is this a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that all these gods and goddesses were prayed to for specific ailments or specific things, and now in the churches that took over from those pagan areas, you have saints who you pray for for the exact same thing that a god or goddess used to be prayed to for. Is that just a coincidence, folks? I think not. I think not. And I'm saying that having read a number of, hey, hey, I looked into this, folks, because when I had to pull out of that church, I wanted to make sure I was making the right decision, because family was there, tradition was there. I mean, and Greek families, man, they're like this. It ain't too easy <laughs> to pull away from that. You know, I had, I had some issues there for a while. Everything's cool now. But uh, anyway... I don't think that it's just a coincidence. And again, there are many examples I give you in the booklet. Let me give you one more as I start to wind this down. Let's go back to Mary for a moment. In the Catholic and Orthodox Church, there are two primary holy days for Mary in the calendar year. March 25th and August 15th. March 25th is the Annunciation of Mary. It's celebrated as that's the day that the angel came to Mary and told her she was going to bear Jesus, the Annunciation Day, March 25th. August 15th, the Dormition Day or the Assumption Day. Mary dies or is bodily resurrected and goes to heaven, August 15th. If you look at those two days in pagan history, March 25th is also a major day in the worship of the mother goddess Cybele. And, and Cybel was worshipped on March 25th. August 15th is the day Diana supposedly went to heaven. Not Saint Diana, the goddess Diana. Isn't that interesting? Once again, mere coincidence again? Folks, we're running into too many coincidences here 
with ancient pagan religion and Greek and Catholic tradition, folks. I don't think that it is a coincidence. Now, one final scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. Again, we want to go to Scripture to, to prove our point on some of this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So we can all count to one, right? I had trouble in math, but I know number one, okay? I could do one, okay? One. One. One mediator. Now, i got to give them their due. What they're going to say is, well... You know, the saints aren't mediators. The, the Mary's not a mediator. Although, there are some in the church who've built up a cult where they want to call Mary the co-mediatrix, okay? That hasn't won the approval of the Pope yet, but hey, there's, there's people in the Catholic Church that want that to happen. One mediator. What, what does mediation mean? It's a go-between. It's someone who stands in the gap for you and does something for you, Okay? When you pray to Mary and the saints, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? The Bible doesn't say you need to do that. Folks, that's a mediatory role. Pray to Mary because she can you know, do this, and, and the saints can do that. They're closer to God than you. That's not what the Bible teaches. We're all on an equal plane here. Yeah, some of us are a little better than others. We'll be honest about that, okay? But we all got problems. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. Mary is not somewhere else. The saints are not somewhere else. Your Bible teaches that over and over and over. And again, any Catholics or Orthodox hearing this, and you're hearing it for the first time and it's new, it may be hard to hear. And when I first heard this, and when I first started to get into this, it took me some while to extricate myself from the tradition I was brought up in. It is difficult to do. But I want to tell you this, you can do it. And according to your Bible, if you want to be in that first resurrection, in God's kingdom, you need to do it. You need to extricate yourself from untruth. John 4, 24, we worship God in spirit, and in truth, in truth, in truth. 